I didn't even turn it on. I did. I just did. I think I did. Yeah, I just did. All right. Thank you, Brady. These guys have to put up with me. Thank you. All right. That's a little better. So in the notes, uh, there's a list of some of the scriptures we're going to be looking at as we go through, if you'd like to follow along. I also made some corrections because of some typos on my part. Uh, it's Luke chapter 18, 10 through 13, no big deal, but Mark is a bigger change. It's Mark chapter 9, verse 35, not verse 23. So as you go along, it's a little bit incorrect, but we're going to put those up on the screen here, so those are the corrected versions, all right? Um, we're launching the Beatitudes series that we started last week, and so I gave an introduction to the Beatitudes last week, just a little introduction, and today we're going to start unpacking them one by one, or one and then two and then another one. We'll see how it splits up, but today we're unpacking Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So we'll be in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 for this. But just as a little cheat sheet, on the bottom of the notes, I've kind of got the summary of each of the Beatitudes. The blessed, who is blessed and what the blessing, the reward of this blessing is. So actually being poor in spirit is a blessing. We think the blessing is the kingdom of heaven, which of course is a blessing. So in each of these, I just want to make it clear, and I didn't mention this last week, but the blessing isn't just the thing that follows, like for they shall see God. The blessing is the condition that we are in. So as you hopefully will see this morning, being poor in spirit is the blessing. Mourning is the blessing. And as we go from there, okay? So Lord guide, Lord just guide us. So let me get into this. The Greek word here, translated as poor, we kind of think poor in spirit, like, oh, I'm poor, you know, well, you'll get by. This word for poor is absolutely destitute. This is not really right to use the word poor. It really should be, blessed are the absolutely destitute in spirit. If we were to use the word poor, it would need to be added to like, blessed are those who are so poor that they could never, ever, ever hope to have the means to pay back their debt, ever. And in this day, what that translated into was a likelihood of slavery. Since I couldn't pay that debt, I would become a slave. I would be the payment for that debt back in those days. So, blessed are the poor in spirit means basically a beggar on the street. No means to make money. No, no way of ever having enough, period, okay? So it's an impossible situation. Impossible. Now, when you think of poor in spirit, and you've thought of poor in spirit, some of you over the years for a long time, when you think of the poor, what poor in spirit really means... Do you sometimes think, well, it's, it's somebody who isn't saved yet. You know, well, somebody who isn't saved is obviously poor in spirit. Somebody who doesn't know the Lord is poor in spirit. Have, have you ever thought that? Or kind of associated, well, those are the people who don't know the Lord. But that's obviously impossible, right, in this situation, because it's the poor in spirit who have the kingdom of heaven. So that, that, that's wrong. Or have, when you think of poor in spirit... 
do you think of someone, well, who sins a lot, you know, who's spiritually destitute, they just are, can't get over their sin, they can't get over the, the thing that's just got them in shackles, you know, they're, they're just stuck in a sin, and in, in a cycle of sin. Do you ever think those are the people who are poor in spirit? Well, that kind of doesn't work either, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? I mean, so we have to kind of rewind and step back and realize this isn't them. This is us. This is those of us who do know God and are yearning for heaven. This is those of us who love our Bibles Love his word. He's speaking to us. He's not speaking to those. He's speaking to me and you. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the question is, am I poor in spirit? Am I? Or in spirit. It's not our they, is he, it's am I poor in spirit. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who are spiritually humble and not spiritually arrogant, which is the opposite of spiritually humble. So blessed are those, blessed am I when I'm not spiritually arrogant. Blessed am I when I'm spiritually humble. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I say, well, I'm humble. You heard the story about the congregation that had the most humble pastor they'd ever had. He was so humble. So they gave him a medal that said most humble pastor. And as soon as he put it on, they had to take it away. Was poor, was Paul, the Apostle Paul, you know, mighty, fierce Paul, you know, give him. I don't think John the Baptist had anything on Paul when it came to, I'm going out there, give me locusts. You know, uh, attacked by wild beasts, Paul, thrown over ships, jumping over city walls, you know, dodging the rocks, and they didn't throw Paul tea parties when he showed up. They threw him riots, you know. Uh, Paul, was he poor in spirit? Do you think of Paul when you think, blessed are the poor in spirit? Do you think of Paul? What do you think of? Do you think of yourself? Do you think of them? What do, you, do you think of Paul? So let me ask you this. Was, was Paul poor in spirit? When he says he considers himself the greatest sinner ever. Is that Paul poor in spirit? What do you think? First Timothy 1.15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance. He's saying this is a trustworthy statement. You can trust this. And it's worthy of all of us accepting. And what is the statement? Me. I. I'm the greatest sinner of all. The more I know my sins... The more I realize that's true. If I quit glossing over them, well, everybody does that. Well, that's okay. That's not a big deal. Or at least I'm not an axe murderer, right? I'm not that bad. See, in the process of allowing the Holy Spirit to increasingly guide and shape him, you see that in Paul's life. So that in that process, Paul was made 
intimately aware of his own sinfulness. As the Holy Spirit is guiding and shaping him, he's realizing, I don't trust God here. I have too much fear. I have too much arrogance. I'm not humble enough. I think I know it all. I don't know it all. God just totally changed my perspective when I thought I knew it all. This person I thought was nobody, I now realize is a giant in the faith. And this person, you know, you just... The Holy Spirit's guiding. He's taking the log out of his own eyes. He's realizing it's there. And he sees a speck in someone else's, but he's got a lot of work in his own, right? See, as the Holy Spirit guides us, just like it had to have been guiding Paul, Every step of the way, when he finally gets to the point late in his ministry where he makes a statement like this. Think of arrogant Paul. All those sinners, all those Jesus followers, I'll go kill them. I'll get them thrown in jail. We'll get them taken care of somehow. And he gets to the point where he says, all those sinners. And he's saying... All of this, a sinner. Wow. He's come a long way by the end of his ministry, hasn't he? A long way. Can I, like Paul, Timothy, can you, like Paul, identify yourself as having literally infinite sin in your life? And you are in desperate need of a surgeon, a soul surgeon, and you could never afford them on your own. Imagine somebody dear to you or you need a surgery and you need medical care and it's going to cost literally a billion dollars. And you're dead without it. And you could never even come up with the first thousand. Are you in need of a soul surgeon? I hope you're, you're, you're going, I'm in need of a soul surgeon. Are you in need of a soul surgeon today or was that just a few years ago? Today? Right now, see, can I, like Paul, identify myself with the literally infinite amount of sin in my life? As soon as I think I got something, you know, moderated, at least at socially acceptable levels, hideable levels that most people wouldn't notice, I'm deceived. Because I don't really, if I'm judging myself by what you notice, Instead of what God notices, I'm deceived, right? I'm deceived. If I think I can go through this life of faith, of discipleship, and think it's good enough that nobody knows my sin, then I'm okay. I'll I'll make it okay. That's a deception. Would it be correct to say that whenever we get swept away, you or me, get swept up, get focused in on something that's just purely self-centered. It's all about me. Whenever we follow a selfish urge, it's all about me, you know, and, and it's what I want, it's what makes me happy, it's what makes me comfortable. Whenever we get swept up in that, we're in grave danger of being sucker punched by Satan. Because all he has to make his sin, his failure, his temptation look like is something easy, something I want in this world. Something, something. And as long as we want that thing and we're really focused on it, we can be sucker punched by Satan real easy. What do you think? Would you agree? Instead of 
the source of all things. What are we focusing on? So would it be correct to say that whenever we're, 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 we're focusing on what I want, that we're also easy prey for Satan? Because we're not focusing on what God wants. As long as I'm focused on what God wants, it's harder for Satan to get to me. But if I'm focused on what I want, he can use my ego, he can use my opinions, he can use people who agree with me. But if I'm focused on what God wants, I can't focus on whether people agree with me or not. We can be easy prey. But when we live a life where the fruit of the Spirit is truly exercised and growing, you know, the love, unconditional love, all the joy unconditional joy, no matter what the situation's like. We'll unpack that in the next series after the Beatitudes. Peace, patience. How many of us have prayed, Lord, hurry up and give me patience, will you? I'm waiting here. All right. When we're not focused on that, and when that's not the goal of our lives... We're stepping into dangerous sin territory. You want an all expenses paid uh, all expenses paid night in hell hotel. I've been there. I'm pretty sure you have if you're of any particular age. You've got that sharp thing in your side. And you just can't let go. And you just can't get the adrenaline to settle down because they did. And that. And that's not right. And that's not fair. And that's wrong. And they, and they, and this, and that. Have you been there? Because I have. Oh, it's an all expenses paid trip. But that place is so far from the kingdom of heaven, isn't it? We might as well call that the kingdom of hell. It's so far from the the place that we would be in if we were resting in Jesus' arms. We might as well call it resting in Satan's. What do you think? And if that's the case then what happens is I'm not living in the reality of Ephesians 1.3, which is giving a glimpse of the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Ephesians 1.3 where Paul says, blessed with every, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And on those nights where I've laid in that bed going, who they, who, who, I'm not in a place of blessing in spiritual places? I'm in the place of cursing in spiritual places. I'm in sin. All the while, I'm focusing on their sin. That sin. I'm in sin. What they did to me, my needs, my wants, my schedule, my uh, people's opinion of me, the way they defame my character, whatever it is. Listen, because when those alarms go off, them, 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 let's switch that around. And let those alarms go off. Me, 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 me. Our chance is now, the invitation the Holy Spirit's giving us is, just don't focus on that thing. Focus on this thing right here, me. Don't focus on them. Focus on yourself, Timothy. Ding, 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 ding. The Holy Spirit's trying to get through here. There's a place in me. 
he wants to enter into. There's a place in me, in my life, he wants to inhabit. We don't mind people coming into the front room of our house most of the time. We just don't want them going into our shelves and our drawers and our closets. And we all have them. When we see how insistent our drive is for our own way, what we want, what's comfortable to us, what I prefer, it's an invitation from God to see how unlike God we are being. Unlike Christ, we are being. How unsympathetic, how uncompassionate, how unhumble, how untrusting, and how unfaithful we become. See, poor in spirit is a a place of being like-minded with God sympathetic with God, compassionate with God, humble and trusting and faithful with God. The Holy Spirit comes knocking through our anger, our entitlement, and says, "Um, so remind me again who you invited to, to sit on the throne of your life. God, right? Uh, That's what I thought. Oh, two seconds later. Remind me again who you invited to be on the throne of your life. Another, like, five seconds later. Uh, Don't mean to interrupt, but who's on the throne? Because if I'm willing to turn my attention from myself, then I'm willing to get off the throne. But as long as the attention is me, guess who the king is? Me. God gives me a brief, delicious holiday in heaven when I can just join him in his peace and his love and his grace. And I'd rather have an all expenses paid holiday with God than Satan. How about you? What do you think? Blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And you feeling cursed? Change your mind. Change what you're focusing on. People being persecuted all over the world today, right now, are put, their physical bodies are being put in positions of torture so that they lose the blood flow in an extremity of their body and it's going numb. Now it's going extremely screaming painful. Now I don't know if it's even there anymore. I can't stand this. And we're supposed to believe we are blessed through Jesus Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And what's amazing is as they turn their attention from their leg or that wound, and this is their own testimony here, by the way, as they tell us, they turn their attention to Christ. They met ministering angels. They were given peace. They forgot about their bodies. They were in heavenly places with Christ and blessed with spiritual blessings. And those people, one after another after another, have been through that. They said it was the greatest spiritual events of my life was being tortured in that prison. Or seeing, and and you go, there's no way. 
you and I, we go, there's no way. Yahweh. Yahweh. He has a plan for your life. And no matter where we are in that life, it could be in that prison cell, we're not out of his plan. Can I get an amen? We are never out of his plan. Now, let me nuance that a little bit. I can be not cooperating with his plan and be out of his plan. I can not be engaged with his plan, but I'm in the place where his plan is. It's up to me to decide whether I'm going to engage, whether I'm going to get on board and cooperate. He has a plan. And guess what? We can trust that his plan, as crazy as it seems, and as how we can't get our head wrapped around it, we want to go to our happy place, something we've done a hundred times before, and he's put us in this discomfort zone, and we don't like it, right? When we, whenever we are, his plan is perfect. This, I said last week, all of this stuff about the Beatitudes is not preparation for life on earth. This is preparation for living life on earth and preparation for heaven. This stuff only makes sense when we say our life is built for eternity. This world is not our home. He has a plan, and it is perfect. It's full of his love. His love is there. That's the greatest blessing of all. What happened to those guys? Carla and I this last year were in Oklahoma City was it Tulsa? Tulsa at the Voice of the Martyrs Conference which is one of the ministries we love the most and personally connected to um, and these, these gentlemen and women are getting up one after another giving their testimonies. Has anybody else ever been there? Were you there last year with us? And they're saying how they experienced God was blessing them when they were being sorely persecuted and tempted. And it reminds me of Stephen being stoned and seeing angels and and heaven open up before him. And he's just in rapture about the glory and love of God. Another stone. Another stone. Wow. So here's the characteristics of being poor in spirit. It doesn't matter the outside circumstances. My focus is on God's love. My focus is on him purifying me, not them. My focus is on the subtle areas that nobody else sees. My focus, if I'm poor in spirit, is being willing to stand, even though it's a socially acceptable thing, to sin. But I'm willing to be poor in spirit when I choose not to, even if it's socially unacceptable. So, let's look at Isaiah 66, 1 through 2. Well, open your Bibles and let's go through this, if you will. Isaiah 66, 1 through 2. Some of you already got there. I'm pretty sure you were planning ahead. Heaven is my throne, says the Lord. And the earth is my throne footstool. Here we are in this wonderful place and it's his footstool. Heaven is his throne. Where then is a house you could build for me? God asks. What could you build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things.
we're busy thinking we made all this stuff, aren't we? <laughs> For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look. And here's the key. To this one I will look. This is blessed of the poor in spirit. To him who is humble and contrite in spirit. And who trembles at my word. What is the characteristic of poor in spirit here? Being humble and and contrite. Contrite means we are so sorry. Like, I, I'm not just, I'm sorry. I'm broken sorry. I am so sorry. I'm broken by it. Contrite means I realize I've done something terrible. We feel the pain of the pain we've inflicted. We feel the sorrow of the sorrow we have inflicted by our behavior. I'm contrite when I feel the pain of another person that I caused. That's humble and contrite of spirit. I regret my actions. I'm sorry for them. I've offended. I I recognize how great they are. I didn't think it would be that big a deal. I didn't mean it to turn out that way. But it did, and oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I meant it for good, but it became evil. You know how things can be? Or I meant it for evil. And it was. Contrite. If we are contrite, we don't take the forgiveness of God for granted. We are grieved at what our sins cost Jesus. Which one of us would want to be first in line in this group to say, all right, let's take this group of people and all their sins and put it on who? 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 They used to have a scapegoat in the Old Testament, put the sins and send the goat into the wilderness. Who wants to be the scapegoat? How would you like to feel the pain of every sin that somebody here has committed? How would you like to feel the consequences of every sin? How would you like to take that on yourself as your own sin? Who here would like to do it for just one other person in this room? And yet every one of my sins were laid on Jesus Christ, weren't they? Who willingly took them upon himself, didn't he? In fact, if there was only one person created in all the world, and it was me. I know, what an arrogant idea, right? Just for the sake of fantasy here, would Jesus still have come to draw me back And gone to the cross for me. Just me. I have to answer that yes. The Jesus of the Bible would have come for just you. Or just me. Contrite. Humble and contrite of spirit. Think of the price Jesus paid for your sin, and it takes your eyes off the price you feel like you're paying for someone else's. It just seems so much smaller. And I'm not belittling any sin that you're feeling the brunt of right now. I'm just saying God promises an alternative for you to focus on. And the Holy Spirit is coming and knocking. Who who was it that you invited onto the throne? Oh, yeah. The Holy Spirit says it was me. Yeah. Think of it. Without a contrite spirit, you know what I am? I'm a proud Pharisee going through the motions of religion but ignoring the sins that I'm harboring in my soul. Jesus said, clean the inside of the cup before you clean the outside. 
That's actually how the outside gets clean. So when I feel the effects of someone else's sin, when I'm contrite in heart, I feel my sin, not theirs. When I feel the effects of someone else's sin, I'm sorry for their sinfulness. I'm sorry that they're in that place. I'm broken because they're broken. I'm connected to them and I feel their pain, but I feel they have that pain inside them even more than inside them than they've inflicted on me. And I can feel bad for them. And then I re- realize, oh my gosh, I've got it too. I'm infected with the same disease. I'm in need of a soul surgeon. I'm in need of a soul surgeon. When I turn to that soul surgeon, I can't afford him. I can never work to pay off that debt. He has to give it to me freely. He has to give it to me. I can never earn it. It would cost way too much. Now, I encourage you to look at Mark 10, 45, and 1 Corinthians 9, 19, and Mark 9, 35, not formerly known as Mark 9, 23, and read that later as a follow-up for today. But I want to skip now to Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. So let's scoot over to Luke, all right? Chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. Two men went up into the temple to pray. I'm just inviting you as we continue this verse to do something crazy that I do. Those two men are both me. I could be one or the other. It's not I'm one and someone else I can think of right now, oh yeah, is the other. I'm both. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector, obviously a sinner, working for the emperor. He's corrupt. The governor, he's corrupt. He's godless. This man is collecting taxes to pay for the Roman army to be imperial and oppressive of his own people, the Jews. He's a betrayer. He's obviously a sinner. Okay. Two men, a Pharisee, a religious leader, if you will, a very popular pastor. Not me, the one who really is a popular pastor. A Pharisee, recognized as a man of God. And a tax collector. And they both go to the temple. They both show up at church. The Pharisee stood and was praying this. God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, those swindlers, the unjust, oh, adulterers. I thank you. I'm not even like this tax collector. (laughs) Thank God. I fast twice a week. Mm Mm-hmm. How often do you fast? I pay tithes of everything I get. Mm Mm-hmm. But the tax collector? He was standing some distance away, obviously. He's unclean and not worthy of somebody like the Pharisee. He was unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven. He was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. God. One, the Pharisee was focusing on those people's sins. The other, the tax collector, was focusing on whose? 
his own. Which one is me in this story? Which one is you? At any given moment of any given day, when the Holy Spirit comes knocking, just checking in again, who was that you invited to be on the throne again? Just checking. Is this the attitude of being poor in spirit, verse 14? Is this the attitude that captures it? Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. And then verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, this man, went to his house justified. This man took communion, making things right with his brother before he took it. This man gave his offering, but his heart was to God when he did it. This man, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 14, 7 through 11. Let's take another look. Luke is, come on, Jesus, take it easy on us. Take it easy on us, right? Luke 14, a little bit, a little bit further back there, four chapters. Verse 7 through 11. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them. So, Jesus is speaking. He's at a guest at a house, and he's the guest of honor. So the guest of honor is put at the top of the table. Oh, you're the guest. You sit here. Sit here. This here. You know. And it's very humbling to be put in that place if you're not full of pride, if I'm not full of pride. So he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table. So instead of letting the person hosting the dinner choose who sits where, you know, put their little name cards or set them down, everybody milling around, enjoying their grapes until they sit down, right? And the guest says, now you sit here, you sit here. They're all arguing already over, no, I get to sit there. Uh -uh, Uh-uh, uh-uh, I get to, uh -uh, uh uh-uh, give me that. Uh -uh, And the tablecloth gets pulled and the the drinks get spilled, you know, and the, the guest is going... This is what Jesus is looking at. Oh my gosh. These people have no clue. They're totally just living for this world. They don't realize that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is here. It's at hand. So he says, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you. You already put yourself in this place. Oh, this is my spot. Get up. Give your place to this man. And then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go And recline. See, they didn't have chairs like this. They had pillows they reclined on. Go and recline. Where? At the last place. So that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say, friend, friend, friend. No, 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 no. Move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. Now, here's the teaching again. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So here's the crazy thing about who you are in this story. If I go, hmm, I'm at this dinner, and I know he's going to put me at the top, but I'll show you. I'm going to look so good when I put myself at the bottom. Oh, my gosh. And then when everybody... 
sees the host come and get me and say, no, 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 you should be at the honor place. I'll just walk past all those people admiring how awesome I am, right? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> that knock comes at the door. Uh, remind me again. See, we can do the fasting. We can do the tithing. We've heard Jesus say it so many times. He wants our hearts, doesn't he? He doesn't want to tithe more than he wants our hearts. The tithe is an expression of our hearts. That we trust him to sign every one of those checks. We trust him to grow every one of the crops in that field. We trust him. Not the number in the account. Poor in spirit. I got to skip through this. Keeping you too long. Paul found the secret. He had found that in the grand scheme of things, his sins were so infinite that he might as well fess up. He's as big a sinner as anyone could get. He's the greatest sinner of all. And here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am the worst. You in need of a soul surgeon? He wants us to take our eyes off the sins of everybody else. Not to, sp- to minimize them, but to maximize him. He's not trying to minimize any sin in the world. He's not trying to say that it's not important. or He's just trying to say he's ready to enter into this situation, and he's coming and he's knocking, but we've got to get our eyes off of that and put our eyes on him. I've got to. You've got to. It doesn't matter what you're in. It doesn't matter what you're up. You say, yeah, but you don't know. Oh, Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray.